And the record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Ms. Brady, are you uh, ready to proceed? Yes, sir. You may do so. Thank you. When does mitigation outweigh aggravation? When the mitigation is the cause of the aggravation. The mental illness, the schizophrenia spectrum disorder, the psychosis is what caused James Holmes to shoot the people in the Century 16 Theater. And had he not been inflicted with the disease that attacked his brain, he never would have dyed his hair orange. He never would have purchased all of those guns and all of that ammunition. And this heartbreaking tragedy would never have occurred. And nothing we do here in this case is going to turn back the hands of time. And nothing we do will bring back those who died or heal the wounds of those who were injured. For nothing can erase July 20th, 2012. And here we are at sentencing. And you'll remember, this will give you a flashback to when we did individual jury selection, and we talked a lot about this chart and how this process worked. And as you know, you've been through phase one. You've determined that four aggravators were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But now we are at phase two. And phase two is about mitigation. And you know by this point what mitigation is. Mitigation is the character and background of James Holmes. It is anything that in fairness or mercy reduces his moral culpability for the crime. And it is anything that you, individually, each one of you, considers for a life sentence. Mitigation is not offered to you as an excuse or a justification or a defense to the crime. The defense part is over. That was the insanity defense, and that was the last trial, and that is over. That technical legal definition of capacity to know right from wrong, that is over. That was the last trial. Whether he goes to a psychiatric hospital, that's over. That's off the table. For you have declared him guilty, you have declared him responsible, and you have declared that he will be punished, and he will be punished. It's just which punishment he gets. And all of the evidence that you've heard about mental illness for three months, you can and should consider when determining whether a life sentence is appropriate in this case. You have heard testimony of family and friends of James Holmes. And you have heard from teachers and neighbors and people from the various phases of his life. And you've heard from those people for two reasons. Number one, before you decide whether a man lives or dies, you have both the right and the responsibility to know everything about his life. And second, that testimony was presented to you so that you would know when he was young, he was a normal and happy young boy before the illness stole his mental health from him. He was born to Bob and Arlene Holmes. His sister was Chris. And when he was young, he laughed and played and had a lot of friends and climbed trees and dug in mud puddles and loved children and loved animals and by all indications was a normal little boy. 
never hurt anyone, never hurt animals, was obedient, by all indications, a normal little boy. And you heard that he has done things like clean up work at the church, working at an orphanage in Tijuana, working at a camp for emotionally disadvantaged children. And those things pr were presented to you to show you that he is not a selfish and self-absorbed person. He was raised in the kind of family that emphasized the importance of good character, that it was important to give back to the community, to volunteer, to help, to think about other people. That is the way Bob and Arlene Holmes raised him. And when he was young, everything seemed fine. You heard from his second grade teacher, Ann Heston, who said, the Jimmy that I had in my class was playful and exuberant. And his fifth grade teacher, Mr. Carr, said, the Jimmy who I had in fifth grade was a smileful boy, well-balanced, had it all, popular. And that's how he was when he was young in that Oak Hills neighborhood. And all of those people came in and they all had such vivid memories of him as this happy little boy. And they all said that they still love and support him even if they haven't seen him for years. But as soon as the Holmes family moved to, back to San Diego around middle school, James Holmes began to change. He no longer went outside and played as much. He no longer had as many friends as he used to. He became introverted and stayed inside and played on the computer and didn't want to interact as much as he used to. And it was like that through middle school and high school. And you heard from friends from that era, and he had some friends, and they would play cards at lunch and maybe go out. But through middle school and high school, the friends that he said the closest to him were at his house one time in all those years. That is in such stark contrast to how he was when he was younger. And in high school, you heard from the track coach who called him a shadow, sort of a shadow person in the group because he was never in the group. He was always just outside the group to the point where he had trouble taking a group picture for the track team. And you heard from a couple of the high school teachers who say, you know, I'm the kind of teacher who really gets to know my students. So for me not to know him better, that says something. That, that tells you how much he worked not to socialize or else I would know more about him. But by all indications, he was a good student. He was polite. He was never mean or rude. All through high school, not a negative complaint about him. And all this progressive introversion that you heard about is the beginning of the schizophrenia affecting him, the prodromal phase, the starting of the illness. And he goes to college, University of California at Riverside. And you hear some more of the same. His friends and roommates there say, he, he was nice, but we had to sort of drag him out to go out with us. Had to sort of drag him, pull him along to do things. And after he got to know him a little bit, it got a little bit better. But he was not the kind to say, hey guys, let's go out to dinner, let's go do something. They had to pull him. Again, an example of this introversion, the beginning of this schizophrenia beginning to affect him. And after he graduates from college, he decides he wants to apply to graduate school. And he sends out five or six applications to graduate schools. And you heard that no one even interviewed him. Despite his grades and his good GRE score, no one agreed to interview him. And that was disappointing and that was frustrating. But did he act out by hurting people or lashing out or acting in anger? He had absolutely no history of acting 
violently in response to frustration or disappointment. And when he did not get into graduate school, he decided to move back in with his parents and again, very reclusive, sleeping a lot, playing video games. And his mom said, like most moms would, you need to get up and you need to go get a job. And you heard that he worked at that pill factory. And that woman who came in and testified, Tara Fournier, and she told you that she has two sons. One has Asperger's and one suffers from autism. And she said that when she interacted with James Holmes, it reminded her of her sons, that there was something just not right with him. He would stare straight through her. And he was not present when she was interacting with him. And those two guys he worked with said that he would stare up into the corner as if he was seeing something and make a, a weird facial expression. And it was more than just being shy, that there was something wrong. He does another round of applications for graduate school, and this time he gets accepted into the University of Colorado at Denver, and so he moves to Denver. And this is really important to him. He really wants this to work, and he commits himself that he's going to try and make this social aspect of school work. And when he begins, it, it go goes okay for a while. This young woman named Gargi asks him out, and he begins a relationship that's important to him. And he has a couple friends who he hangs out with. And for a while, it's going OK. And in the classes, where all he has to do is read and take notes and take tests, and he can sort of do it by himself, he does fine. But when you add a social component to that, the lab work, where you have to work with the other people in the lab, or the presentations, where you have to stand in front of a group and talk, his social anxiety was getting to the point where he could not do those things. And that is why his schoolwork began suffering. He could not do the social aspect that graduate school required. And by the time he got to June of 2012, he could not do those, those, the final oral exam. And by that point, he was so sick, he was just sort of off the track. But neuroscience was important to him. And you heard from Arlene Holmes that he decided when he was 14 years old to go into neuroscience. <laughs> And that's because he knew that his mind was broken. Something was wrong with it. And if he went into neuroscience, maybe he could fix it. And if he could fix his own mind, then he wouldn't have to tell anyone about these awful thoughts that he was having. And if he could fix it, he wouldn't have to suffer the embarrassment of the stigma of mental illness. And so he went to neuroscience to figure it out. And he got on the internet trying to figure out what was wrong with his brain. Because he wanted help, but he didn't want anyone to know. And that was his dilemma. Mental illness can strike like cancer. Without regard to your background, without regard to your status in life, without regard to how intelligent you are. And when James Holmes was born, he had this psychotic mental illness in his blood, in his DNA. He had a paternal grandfather with a psychotic mental illness. He had a maternal grandfather with a psychotic mental illness. And he has an aunt who has suffered from schizoaffective disorder, a psychotic illness, for 30 years. She's been disabled by this illness. And so when J it, mental illness runs through this family, and when James Holmes was born, he got it. And so from the beginning, it was in his DNA. In the spring of 2012, when he was at graduate school, 
he began to recognize that he was losing the battle of this turmoil going on in his head. He began to realize that. And so he thought he needed to seek some help, finally. And he voluntarily, on his own, made an appointment at the University Mental Health Center, and he went to see a psychiatrist. And the moment he walked in, he tells them he has thoughts of killing people. And he has seven more appointments with a psychiatrist, and each and every time he tells them he has thoughts of killing people up to three to four times a day. And no, he doesn't tell them the date or when it's going to happen, but he tells them he's having these thoughts. And he's ambivalent. He wants Dr. Fenton to help him, but he doesn't. He feels like he needs to complete this mission, but he wants someone to stop him. And that is because he is sick. He is having these thoughts because he is sick. But there are moments where he is hoping someone will recognize it. Perhaps when he says, I'm thinking about having thoughts of killing people, that someone will do something to stop him because he can't control it anymore. And you've heard that on March 21st, he was prescribed sertraline. And you have in evidence the paperwork that was found in Mr. Holmes' apartment about the prescription sertraline. And on the paperwork that came with the, the prescription, it's an emergency if after taking that medication, you begin acting on dangerous impulses. If you begin acting aggressive or violent, that these are the possible side effects of that medication. And if he begins the medication on March 21st, within four to five days, March 25th, he's telling Gargi for the first time about this human capital delusion within five days of starting that medication. And he wrote in his notebook and he told Dr. Metzner, as soon as I took that medication, I lost all fear. Things began to happen in super speed. He began describing manic symptoms after starting that medication, and he felt that it may have made his symptoms worse. And the sertraline is increased once, and the sertraline is increased again, and shortly thereafter, he begins to order guns and ammunition and ballistic gear and handcuffs and tear gas canisters and road stars and stuff that is completely and absolutely out of character for James Holmes. Spending all of his money on this gear that he prior to that time had had absolutely no interest in. And he began to prepare for what he called a mission to increase his human capital and that mission took over his friendships. That mission took over his education. That mission took over his life. Now you have heard testimony from a lot of experts who believe that Mr. Holmes um, was mentally ill. Um, and, and we've put together a chart of the experts Dr. Gurr, Dr. Metzner, Dr. Reed, Dr. Woodcock. Those are the four doctors who examined and evaluated Mr. Holmes. All four say serious mental illness. Three of the four say delusional, and even Dr. Reed says, well, I'm leaning toward that it's a delusion. All four say psychotic. All four uh, diagnose him with a schizophrenia spectrum <laughs> disorder, and all four say that it's either like the but-for cause or the direct result of the shooting was the mental illness. And you heard from Dr. Metzner on Monday of this week, but you heard from Dr. Dr. Reed months ago. So I wanted to remind you what he said about the mental illness's um, involvement in this shooting. And he was asked the question, is it your opinion, sir, that absent his mental condition we wouldn't all be here, would we? 
And Dr. Reed said, that's a true statement. And he was asked, this crime would never have taken place without the mental illness. And Dr. Reed said, that's true, in my opinion, yes. And Dr. Reed said, I believe there is a substantial relationship between the presence of the mental illness and the eventual carrying out of the event. Those are the doctors appointed by the court saying that but for this mental illness, that shooting would never have occurred. There's evidence that Mr. Holmes was mentally ill before, during, and after July 20th of 2012. Evidence that he was mentally ill before July 20th, the meetings with Dr. Fenton. Now you have her records and her reports and evidence. If you want to look at those, go look at those. But they indicate her belief and worry that he was on the verge of a psychotic break. And the notebook. The notebook was from before July 20th. And you can look at that. Dr. Fenton and Dr. Feinstein, these are some of the things pulled out of their notes and their reports. That, that Mr. Holmes glances around the room, room in an odd way. He's odd and bizarre, paranoid. Uh, the starting of a nervous breakdown. That stuff that existed before July 20th, 2012. And that notebook, the writings in the notebook, the first half of that notebook is just disorganized thoughts. It does not make sense. It's the writings of a psychotic person. Why do persons commit to zero or negative infinity? All men are created equal and all men are uncreated equal, but in between there is inequality. That is the writings of a psychotic person and he does that for pages and then he applies that psychotic level of thinking to this psychotic plan that he comes up with about the theater. And that is all before July 20th, 2012 evidence that he is psychotic during the shooting. You have those pictures. Does that look like a neuroscience graduate student to you? Or does that look like someone who is in the middle of their first psychotic break? Does this apartment look like the apartment of a neuroscience graduate student or does this apartment look like someone who is in the middle of their first psychotic break? And when he is arrested, he's arrested for, for shooting multiple people and he's taken to the interrogation room and he's doing this strange thing under the table and then he sits up and then he does the strange thing under the table and they put the bags on his hands and he's doing this. That is not an appropriate reaction for the situation. If you are arrested for murder and taken to the police station, that is not the appropriate reaction. That is the reaction of a schizophrenic person who is psychotic. And after he's put in the jail, after his arrest, and he's still writing that galactic colonization writing that he's doing, the, the symbol, that symbol that you've seen, that symbol was on his calendar in his apartment. That symbol was in the notebook. And he keeps that symbol in his jail cell. And he says that it's the ultraception. All perspectives at once and not and every. All thoughts at once. All space and for times at once. All contradictions at once. Everything, every action, every descriptor all in one. Most simplified the complete every all as an ulti ultimate conception. Problem of con unconceivable, conceivable, the paradox. That makes no sense. That is evidence of his psychosis. And then in November of 2012, when he becomes obviously and floridly psychotic, and can you imagine what it must have took 
for the jail to call for an ambulance twice for him. You know, they have medical facility, they have doctors and nurses and a, and a medical unit, but he was so sick, they called for an ambulance to take him to the hospital twice. And he ends up in the hospital and he tells the doctor, you, and you watched this video, where he thinks that shadows are after him and he is trying to hide under the blankets while four points strapped to the bed. And you saw his struggle to try and get under the blanket because he's scared of something that's not there. Because he is psychotic. And that's why they gave him Haldol. And it's helped him. And he has remained on that because it helped him because he's psychotic. We called Dr. Metzner to testify on Monday of this week. And we called him to testify, and I borrowed these slides from Mr. Brockler's first closing after the first trial, um, because it describes Dr. Metzner was handpicked by the Colorado, Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo. He was appointed by the court. He is forensically trained and certified. He did not change his practice to suit anyone in this case. He's board certified in forensic psychiatry. He's done one to 200 sanity evaluations before. Court appointed 80% of the time in those cases. He's worked for both the defense and the prosecution. He's reviewed all records and reports in the case. He called everyone, including doctors Woodcock, Hanlon, and Gurr. He's worked hundreds of hours reviewing the case, 120 plus page report, did a detailed job and report, got corroboration for things that he looked at, did a detailed analysis and he gave a clear opinion. And you will recall that his opinion was that Mr. Holmes is mentally ill. Now he said that he knew, could distinguish between right or wrong, but make no mistake about it, he said that he is seriously mentally ill. And you have Dr. Metzner's resume, his CV, back in evidence. If you want to look at it and see if you think that he's qualified to tell you whether or not Mr. Holmes is mentally ill, but we called him to tell you again, and we called him because he wasn't hired by us. He never met us before. He w had never met us until this case. He was appointed by the Mental Health Institute on behalf of the court. And we asked him about whether James Holmes was mentally ill. And Dr. Metzner told you, but for the psychosis, the shooting would never have happened that the shooting was a direct result of the mental illness. That people don't choose to be mentally ill and they don't choose the content of their delusions. That Mr. Holmes' judgment was impaired like that of someone who was intoxicated or like that of someone who has Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, he can make decisions, but the decisions he makes are tainted by the mental illness. And the choices he makes are tainted by the mental illness. And that schizophrenia spectrum disorder can cause inappropriate emotional response, inappropriate emotional numbing. And that there were triggers to Mr. Holmes's psychosis, breaking up with his girlfriend, not doing in, as well in school as he would have liked, were stressors or triggers which triggered the psychosis, and then the psychosis caused him to be delusional and come up with this plan to shoot people in the theater. And no one, no one has said that Mr. Holmes is malingering or feigning or faking or exaggerating psychiatric symptoms. No one. It is undisputed that he is seriously mentally ill. 
prosecution has tried to come up with other motives for this shooting. And it makes sense when something tragic and sense, senseless like this happens, you try and, and come up with an explanation for it. You try to understand it. And this case in particular was so random and so senseless. But the mere senselessness of it shows that it's psychotic. There was no political statement or religious statement or statement of any kind to be made by what happened at that theater. All it was was James Holmes and that delusion about human capital. He was not trying to send the media some grand statement about anything. He is not the kind of person who seeks notoriety. He's not looking for attention. He's never looked for attention. He did not send anything to the New York Times or to the Denver Post. He sent his notebook to his psychiatrist. And he told Dr. Reed several times this had nothing to do with notoriety. Was that part of the way you wanted to be remembered as of May, June, July of 2012? I didn't think of that back then. Tell me about being remembered and how you thought about or may have thought about being remembered in April, May, June, July of 2012. I don't know how to answer that. How'd you want to be remembered? Um, I don't remember that being a reason at the time. A reason for what? A reason uh, for doing the shooting was to be remembered. I don't remember that uh, at the time of the shooting, that being a factor coming into play. Is it important to you to be remembered? Let me rephrase that. At the time, was it important to James Holmes to be remembered? I don't know if I came up with that at the time. Or if I analyzed what all the pictures were. It was not about notoriety. It was not about hatred. It was about the delusion. And although Mr. Holmes is medicated and he's stable, Dr. Metzner told you he remains and will always suffer from schizophrenia because the medication doesn't cure schizophrenia. What it does is that it sort of tamps down those positive symptoms, but it, it is less effective on negative symptoms and on delusions. And so Mr. Holmes has the negative symptoms of, he's sort of just introverted into himself. And then you add the antipsychotic medication on top of that and one of the negative symptoms is the uh, inappropriate emotional response and you have watched him during this trial we have all watched him during this trial because think of all the testimony that we've heard in the last three months and we look at him and we look for a reaction and we look for a response and there is rarely if ever a response from him at all to any of this because that is the illness, that is the inappropriate emotional reaction, the inappropriate emotional numbing, and on top of that, the medication. And that is the illness. But what those medications do do for him, they keep him from wanting to ram his head into a wall. And they keep him from thinking that his food is poisoned, and that keeps him from um, smearing feces and licking the walls and all of the things, those positive symptoms that have affected him. And so he takes that medication faithfully. The question boils down to, does the mitigation outweigh the aggravation? Does the mental health mitigation and the other mitigation 
Is it enough to outweigh aggravation such that a life sentence is appropriate in this case? And if you decide that mitigation does outweigh aggravation, or if you're unsure whether mitigation outweighs aggravation, but if you decide it does or you're not sure, now is the time to say so. Now is the time to say so. You give the word, and this ends with a life sentence. Thank you. The fact that his family supports him, the fact that he's never been in trouble, he went 24 years never getting in trouble, and you heard the testimony of his parents and his sister, and you can judge for yourself the sincerity of their testimony, and that they care and love him, and will always visit him and always write to him, and that he is important to them. And the law tells you that at this phase, each one of you decides mitigation for yourself. What is mitigation for you may or may not be mitigation for you. You may value mitigation differently than you value mitigation. And the law says, that's OK. That's what you're supposed to do here. Unlike that first trial, unlike aggravation, this is up to you as an individual to make a moral determination about what value you assign to this mentally ill man's life. You know a lot about the James Holmes from 2011 and 2012, and now you know a lot about the James Holmes before that mental illness robbed his future and his reality and replaced it with this tragedy. I've heard the, the prosecution ask, yes, it, maybe he's mentally ill, but, but did it affect his functioning? Well, if smearing feces and licking the wall and turning somersaults with a cup on your penis, if that is not mental illness that affects your functioning, what is? And if throwing away all your personal relationships and throwing all the, away all the hard work you did in school and amassing this arsenal of weapons with your money for this plan to increase your human capital by killing a bunch of people you've never met before, if that is not a mental illness that has affected your functioning, then what is? The way it appeared on July, July 20th is the way it appears three years later. He is mentally ill. He is obviously mentally ill. And if you decide that, that mitigation outweighs aggravation, if you decide that that devastating and serious mental illness was enough to outweigh that mitigation because it caused it, that aggravation because it caused it, you need to tell your foreman, I've given this careful consideration, I've seriously considered everything that I've heard and seen, but for me, in my heart, and in my soul, mitigation outweighs aggravation. And the foreman may agree with you, or he may think differently, but nonetheless, he will respect your decision. And he will sign his name on section two of those verdict forms. He will bring that decision back into this courtroom. And then James Egan Holmes will live the rest of his life in a prison cell. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Mr. Bruckler, do you need a minute? Yes, sir. Please. All right.
what if he had chosen to only murder three? What if he'd chosen to rip from their lives only three other human beings? These three human beings. Gordon Cowden at the theater with two of his daughters watching this movie. Gordon Cowden after the defendant. Rebecca Wingo, mother of two daughters, at the movie for an adult night out. Rebecca Wingo, after the defendant. Or maybe Jonathan Blunk, young father of two. And you'll remember that Mr. Blunk died trying to protect the person he was seeing the movie with. This is that father of two after the defendant. If he had just chosen to stop killing after three, and when I say chosen, I mean his gun didn't jam, it was a decision. We would still be here. And the question to be asked would be, all this that you've heard over the last week, all the words and the passion from Miss Brady, would they outweigh what happened to those three parents? Can anything? This is phase two. This is not the phase where you decide, I think death is appropriate or I think life is appropriate. Judge, I'm, a, I'm gonna object, that's a misstatement of the law. Members of the jury, um, Mr. Bruckler is making an argument um, and um, you, it's okay for the lawyers to make arguments. Please remember, however, that you're bound by my instructions of law. Uh, so the, I've told you what decisions you have to make in this phase of the proceedings, uh, and this is part of the sentencing hearing. So um, in a way, both lawyers are right. Uh, Ms. Brady is indicating that this, is, this goes to the bigger picture, but um, uh, Mr. Bruckler is also right that this is not the specific question you have to decide right now. Does that make sense? And everybody's saying yes and not in their head yes. Okay, Mr. Bruckler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And again, don't ever take my word for what the law is, please. Read the instructions that the court gives you. And what you're going to see is that this phase is about weighing, but it's what do we weigh? You have found aggravation, and we'll revisit that at the end. And that gets weighed against mitigation. And we don't know what that is yet. You have to determine what mitigation exists based on what came out of this stand, based on the documents, the pictures, the videos. And you have to ask yourself, even now, before we talk about the aggravation, before we talk about the many other victims, is there anything or everything that you saw in the last week that could outweigh what happened to Gordon Cowden and the other two parents. This is what the law says. Beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to find, one, first off, that mitigating factors exist. And then you have to find that they don't outweigh the aggravating factors that we already know exist. One of the things that you can consider is mercy, but not mercy for anyone out here. It has to be mercy for him and him alone. And it can't be a mercy that you brought with you from outside. It can't be a mercy based on something that you've read outside or thought of. It has to be a mercy based upon the evidence that's presented in this courtroom. Judge, I'm going to object. It's a misstatement of the law. Would counsel approach, please? <laughs>
the objection is sustained, but Mr. Brockler, you may clarify. Thank you, Your Honor. Th this is right out of the instruction. This is what mercy must be based upon. It must be based upon the evidence that you heard in this courtroom. A sympathy. There's a lot of sympathy that was brought forward from right here, my gosh, over the last two days. And Mr. and Mrs. Holmes brought it with them. And it is right to feel sympathy for the parents of a mass murderer. It is right to feel sympathy for people that have to come here and talk about their son in a way that they think will encourage you to spare his life. It is impossible to imagine what they are going through. And you could hear the pain in their voices. You could see it in their faces. All of that is true. And it is right that you feel it. But where it cannot play a role is in this phase. It cannot form the basis for you to weigh the mitigators against the aggravator. Judge, I'm going to object. That's a misstatement of the law. Overrule. If you feel sympathy that you want to bring into these deliberations, it must be sympathy for him, not for them. Feel it. Even talk about it. But it can't be part of this process. And we saw a lot of pictures and a lot of videos, the kinds of pictures and videos that most people have their kids. We heard from friends, we heard from family, we heard from teachers. These are all the things that are normal for a child because the truth is nobody's born a mass murderer. That happens later. There are decisions and choices and ramifications that take place. Nobody's born a mass murderer. How many videos of him eight years and younger, or pictures of him with his family, would it take to outweigh that horror? Kids change. Anyone that has been a kid or had a kid knows that how someone is at six or seven is not how they are at 16, 17, 24. People change with or without anything else going on in terms of mental illness. That can't be it. We heard a lot of people from middle, middle school, high school, and college. And what was remarkable about all of them is the consistency in the way they describe this guy. He is unchanged, virtually, from age 11. And you heard from the graduate students and the professors and everyone else that testified from CU in the guilt phase unchanged. Nobody sees any difference in this guy. What if, what if he'd have chosen to stop murdering at four? We know from Dr. Hanlon, the defense's hand-picked expert, that that's enough to qualify you as a mass murderer, maybe the junior level of mass murder. What if he'd have stopped murdering at four and he stopped with Alex Sullivan? You'll remember Alex. He was 27. It was his birthday. He was in the row with all of his other friends from Red Robin. And my God, so many turned out for him. That was before the defendant. This is him after. What if he'd have stopped murdering at four? Would the videos and the pictures and the eloquent statements, the passion, would it have outweighed them? You're going to get instruction number four here. It's the one that you heard the judge read for about three hours. Which I'm going to object. Other rule. This one is the longest instruction you'll have ever seen in this case. And what is important to note about it is it is the defense theory of mitigation. You don't have to treat it as a fact. You don't even have to consider these to be mitigation. Judge, but I'm, going to, I'm going to object. Can we approach? Yes.
That objection is overruled. Read the instruction where it tells you that you're not required to consider this mitigation. This is really almost like an entirely second closing statement that they get. That's what it sounded like. That's the way it reads. One of the things that you'll note from both that instruction and the argument you just heard is no matter what you're told about, hey, this isn't about who's responsible or not, there's a lot of blame being thrown around here. There's going to be suggestions in there by Ms. Brady that we should blame the drugs that he stopped taking two months before this happened. The drugs that no expert tells you had any impact on this crime. We're also encouraged in this instruction to blame Drs. Fenton and Feinstein, even though no experts came to say they made a single mistake, but they're to be blamed for making a decision based on the information he withheld from them. But that's not what this is about. The biggest part of this, as you've heard, is the mental illness. But that's not enough. What our law could have said, as we talked about in the guilt phase, was serious mental illness means you can't be held accountable for your conduct. But we saw that that wasn't the case. In this phase, what the law could say is if you have a mental illness, even a serious mental illness, you are not eligible for death or that mitigator trumps all aggravators. But guess what? It doesn't. In fact, in the law that the court provides you, the statutory mitigators, mental illness isn't even in there. It talks about capacity. Is mental illness going to be a shield here to protect someone who we will see had the ability to make a million decisions and act completely rationally in every other aspect of his life. Is this mental illness a shield to treat him differently? And let's acknowledge something here. Nobody, nobody in their right mind could plan the massacre of a theater full of human beings. And we should take comfort in that. But not having the same brain that we have does not protect you from the ramifications of those decisions. And that's what they're telling you. Objection, Your Honor, that misstates what I said. Overrule. Folks, I remind you this is argument. All right, you may proceed. He's wrong. Mental illness is everything. I'm the biological mother. She's a surrogate. They took him away from me. And then it's all she can say. No, they had mental illness. Tell you, all of my family's full of FBI. He's got, he's got a All right, please be seated, everyone. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. What the instruction tells you for statutory uh, mitigation is the issue is not mental illness. The issue is the capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of someone's conduct, and it's not just impacted or affected or even impaired. The law says you have to find that it's significantly impaired. Same thing with the other component of this. It's not enough that he has some impairment or some concern with the capacity to uh, conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. It has to be significantly impaired, and what we're going to see is it's not there. We've heard a lot about the diagnosis again schizophreniform, schizoaffective, schizophrenia. We've heard a lot of words and yet none of those words dictate the outcome of this case. And we know about the spectrum. Can I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes, you can. Thank you. Go ahead. What we've heard from both state-appointed experts is that the diagnosis isn't what's important. The diagnosis isn't the mitigator. It's whether or not it impacts his function. It's whether or not it impacts his capacity. And what we've heard is he has a psychosis. But remember what Dr. Metzner said? The reason he has a psychosis, we've concluded that, is because he has a delusion. And the reason we say he has a delusion 
Dr. Messner says, is because he wants to increase how much he values himself by killing others. And it's because he has that belief that he is called psychotic. And it is because he has that belief that he qualifies for all the other spectrum disorder potential diagnoses. Because of that belief. And the issue is, does that belief provide a mitigator? And does that belief overwhelm his ability to make decisions? Is it a, f remember delusion was supposed to be this false fixed belief? It can't be proven false for him because he believes it. He believes he's worth more now than he was before. It can't be proven false to him. Is it fixed? Do you remember how he described it to Dr. Metzner? He said, well, it's based on the number of people killed, uh, their own perceptions of what life is worth. It's very subjective. And your contribution to society. Children are worth more than other people, he says, because they have the rest of their life to live. But he talks to Dr. Reed and says, nope, it's points. You could say a millionaire was more important than a homeless person, but I just attribute it to an intrinsic value of this person is worth one. I get it. He has passed every single test they can provide him to test malingering on that test. I can't tell you anything different than that, but you know this. This guy right here cannot tell the same story twice to any of these mental health providers about what drives him to kill. He gives a different version of that. He gives a different version of shadows, of other hallucinations. Whatever mental illness he has, it doesn't keep him from changing his story. What they all agree upon, though, is this. That delusion, that belief system, that's his motive. And Dr. Metzner says, but for him wanting to kill people, he would not have killed people. Agreed. Dr. Reed says, yeah, that's true, but the rest of the transcript, the rest of the testimony, his report says, but that's true of if he didn't come to Colorado. This might not have happened then. Had he not broken up with his girlfriend, but for that, it might not have happened. So the issue is, where can we find what drove this guy before July 20th, 2012? The G-chat. Remember that? That's him unplugged. That's him talking intimately, one-on-one, -on -one, to the woman that he loves. And how about the notebook? The notebook was written in anticipation of something, and it wasn't Dr. Fenton using it to help others. Will you visit me in prison? And there's only one way to get there, and that's through this. When he writes that notebook, his anticipation isn't it's going to be kept secret by Dr. Fenton. He knows it will go somewhere else. This is his way of describing himself going into this horror. And he talks about human capital. Capacity to appreciate wrongfulness is significantly impaired. Remember the G-chats? Of course he knows it's wrong. There's no impairment there. Taking a life will prevent a person from having their purpose. You'll prevent them from their purpose if you take away their life. Gargi comes back and says, it feels like it's destruction. You're not gaining anything from this. And does he respond and say, no, no, I, I, I get it. No. He says, I don't believe there's absolute good or evil. He has the ability to choose. He says in that chat on March 25th, my outlook on destroying my life, not taking in human capital, not increasing my value, on destroying life is plan B. He picks plan B. He doesn't mention anything about this to, to Roth, to Fenton, to Feinstein, nor to Woodcock. He has the ability, according to Dr. Metzner and Dr. Reed, to make choices. He's able to make decisions. So it's not enough to think he can improve himself to himself by killing people. It doesn't keep him from making the decision not to kill. No one has told you he had to do it in this phase. What if he'd have stopped killing at five? What if he had stopped murdering with John Larimer? Do you remember John? John Larimer, and by the way, I screwed up on those pictures. That, that, that's Alex Sullivan, and I, I apologize. Forgive me for that. John Larimer is our Navy guy who was, uh, his friends attempted to drag him to safety. Do you remember that? And had to abandon him because he came back in. This is John Larimer after the defendant. 
Dr. Metzner and Dr. Reed say whatever's going on with him, with mental illness, it didn't impact his ability to function. You have to determine if he was able to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. And if they weren't, was it because he was significantly impaired? Look at what he's doing at or about the time leading up to all of these conversations that he's having, all of his planning. He files his taxes, both in Colorado and California. He tells mom about it. He tells his dad he claimed himself as a dependent. He says in his notebook that when he's seeing Dr. Fenton and Dr. Feinstein, he's deliberately trying to deflect incriminating questions. And by the way, that's the only use we get to have for these statements in this notebook, is to rebut that mitigation, is to say that is not mitigation. His G-chat, March 25th, the next day is March, or three days later is March 28th, and he's emailing his dad about his retirement, about putting $4,500 into his Roth IRA. Is that impairment of capacity? Is that significant impairment of capacity? Later on, he petitions for in-state tuition. You've got the voluminous emails, all of the assignments he was able to do, do well and on time, all of the detailed planning, the purchases. He sends an application for unemployment benefits on June 16th. Where is the impairment? Where is the suggestion that this guy has left the tracks and has no ability to make decisions? July 8th, he still has the ability to mislead Hillary Allen. I still have a couple months left on my lease. 11 days later, he'll be planting bombs in his apartment. This is someone who has the capacity to make decisions and choices. Remember the officer from Winter Park? We covered this in the closing on the guilt phase to conform his conduct to the law. When he's pulled over, he doesn't want anyone seen in his car. So he goes and he gets window tinting on the 11th and installs it after checking online what the law is on window tinting. Does that sound psychotic? Does that sound like someone who doesn't have a grasp of reality or the capacity to conform their conduct to the law? He's anticipating the law intervening in his massacre. That's why he buys the road stars the day before his prelims and puts them in the front of his seat in case he had to get away in a pursuit, not from the moviegoers, but from the police he was sure would come after him. He's got money in his pocket. He takes Vicodin because he thinks the law will want to do, bless you, will want to do something to hurt him after this. Same thing with the first aid dressing. Capacity to appreciate wrongfulness significantly impaired. How about more of the G-chats? What I feel like doing is evil, so I can't do that. What is so evil? Killing people, of course. Killing people's too much effort. She reminds him, the law says not to do it, you'll get locked up. And then he comes back with a rationalization. I'd lose the rest of my life. There's no way to do it and not get caught, and that's why you kill many people, because he's able to weigh it. Yep. I'll go to prison, that's why I'm going to get a lot out the door. And that's exactly what he does here. You wait to kill until the end of your life, there's nothing to lose. He says, despite knowing death is false in the notebook that he sends off before going to do this massacre. He talks about the cruel twists of fate to the unkind. This guy knows what he's doing is wrong. This guy knows what he's doing is illegal. And then there's that interesting thing towards the end where he writes research firearms laws and mental illness why would he need to do that <coughs> is that significant impairment of his capacity that's the opposite of significant impairment and you remember what dr metzner said that delusion that psychosis that motive it, that motive that he had it was selfish there's no other word for it it was all about him from start to stop what if he'd have stopped killing at six? What if he'd have stopped murdering at Jesse Childress, our other service member? Remember the one that was magnanimous and bought all the tickets for his friends? That's Jesse Childress after the defendant. That's halfway, folks. What have you seen or heard here in the last week? How many videos of dogs and surfing and the cute kid at Christmas would you see 
to outweigh six people ripped out of their lives in that fashion. Choices. He tells us in the notebook, the real me, namely the thinking me, does things not because I'm programmed to, but because I choose to. Those are the words he chose to write. You've heard in one of the non-statutory mitigators in, in the uh, defense instruction, they say mental illness was the cause of this, that it was but for. But I want you to think about the other reasons this occurred, the bigger reasons. Academic rejection. You remember that? On, on February 23rd, he writes to his girlfriend, the professor got pissed, Mark Delacqua. He tells his dad a week later, finished up my second lab, professor got peeved, told me not to join his lab. Months later, to Hillary Allen, sick of Delacqua yet? He would always linger way too long. He got pissed at me. Six weeks, and he is perseverating on the fact that he was rejected academically. He continues to disparage Professor Delacqua to this future love interest. He just goes off and quotes random shit. Now, what if he'd have stopped killing at seven? What if he'd have stopped killing with Alexander Teves, who had just gotten his master's degree? Do you remember? In social work? Goodness. I don't have that picture. But you'll remember Alexander Teves was shot mercilessly in the head. And this is what he looked like before the defendant. Thank you. Mental illness was the cause. But for, how about the romantic rejection? He writes in his notebook that he knows is going out the door before the massacre. The last battle I lost, I finally succumbed to, was falling in love. He talks to his dad about Gargi breaking up with him. It hasn't been the best of times. He tells his mom the Gargi situation is complex complete disassociation. He doesn't know what to do with himself. In the notebook, he tells us before the massacre, with love gone, my motivation was directed to wait for it. Human capital? Increasing his self-worth? Motivation is directed to hate. What if he'd have stopped killing after eight? What if he'd have stopped killing the young lovers, the fiancés in the theater, with this picture taken moments before he separated them forever? Would all the things you've heard in the week leading up to this, would they outweigh that? But for hatred. Hatred. His friend, Ben Garcia, closest friend in grad school, tells you he was angry at the world. We know from his notebook, he says, if I reveal to Fenton and Feinstein my plan, not only will my normal life be gone, but my ideal enactment on not self-actualization, not self-improvement, not self-worth, hatred will be foiled. Embrace the hatred, my long-standing uh, hatred of mankind. He writes down love and hate, hatred unchecked, his primary drive, reversion to hatred of mankind, the long-standing hatred of mankind. Remember love gone, motivation directed to hate, embrace the hatred. He tells William Reed, he asks him, what did the shootings have to do, if anything, with hating people? And by the way, these are the statements he makes after he's been charged with murder. These are the statements he makes after he's been told there will be a death penalty on the table. And he says, just that they make me anxious, and because they make me anxious, I hate them. What does he tell Woodcock four days after he's arrested for this massacre? I hate everybody. What if he'd stopped killing after Matthew McQuinn? Where would we be? Would we say all the things that we heard, all the explanations, all the passion, that that outweighed them? This is what he looked like before. Do you remember? This is what he looked like after the defendant. That's Matt McQuinn. With the woman he'd hoped to, uh, hope to get engaged to that night. But for the desire, the desire to kill, he decided to dedicate his life to killing others. When? After he met with Mel Lipsy in his early teens. He tells us he's had an obsession to kill, not since Sir Trilline, not since high school, since I was a kid. Mass murder at the movies, his first obsession since more than 10 years ago. The last sentence of his notebook, the last sentence, is life shouldn't exist. 
hatred. That's self-worth. And he wants to be remembered. No matter what he tells Dr. Reed in the months before this trial begins, we know what he did. We know for his profile, he lets people know, these women that may visit it, will you visit me in prison? And that precedes the notebook. And here's what I want you to look at. If he's driven by self-actualization, by increasing his self-worth, why does he do this analysis of why not an airport? Too much of a terrorist history. Terrorism isn't the message. If he is consumed by this delusion to increase his self-worth, why, oh why, in the last things he writes before he carries out this massacre, does he care about how people will interpret it? Because that's part of it. He goes on to criticize people. Most fools are going to misinterpret why I did this. The selfies. He may not have sent them to the New York Times, but we know he took them for the New York Times. Those black contact lenses just showed up. He tells Dr. Metzner, Dr. Metzner, they'd look good to whoever viewed them. He's anticipating people getting these pictures that he never sent to the Times. Took selfies, had pretty specifically, you want to be remembered? Right. I don't think people are going to remember me for any other reason. It's unusual to have dyed hair like that, he agrees, and he says, it's because it's more likely to be remem you'll remember something unusual than something mundane. Is it important to be remembered? He tells William Reed in the part of the clip they didn't show you, I'd say yes. There's that picture, that ominous picture that he took, that he posed for, that he wants to post to the New York Times, but he doesn't. On the last page of his notebook, he directs people to Squarespace. One of the things that you're told to consider is his cooperation with law enforcement as a mitigator. Remember that the evidence was from them that, oh, it would have never really worked. They didn't really, he didn't really think it was going to work. So why cooperate? Because he'd set out to accomplish something to make him value himself more and for notoriety, and that was done. He didn't need the apartment anymore. It didn't cost him anything to cooperate. It wasn't for some noble purpose. He doesn't have it in him. Will you visit me in prison? And it looks like the answer is yes. This is why he did this. Do you see the pictures of Zuby up there? The pictures mom and dad gave him? No. This is his interest. Maybe he could have stopped killing after 10. What if he'd have stopped murdering after 10 and we'd have had Michaela Medic, the unfortunate one who moved to the back. Do you remember that? Saw two seats open there, a friend and she went back there, and it turned out to be the unluckiest, unfortunate, cruelest decision she could have made. That's how she's left by him after she meets him. <coughs> Lying in wait from an ambush. You know that he created this kill box, this one right here. Can't get out of here. And any exits he tried to close down. He brought 700 rounds. He fired steel penetrator rounds. He surprises the people that he wants to kill. He traps the people that he wants to kill. Lying in wait. To do it, he needed patience. This guy who was reacting only to this bizarre delusion that was driving him in all his decisions was able to plan for three months this massacre, and at the moment it was going to take place, he could sit still, sit calm, Watch his victims take their seats. There was no haste. He uses the cell phone ruse to make sure he doesn't trouble them and encourage them to see what's going on. He keeps the door open. And then he begins this especially heinous, cruel, and depraved manner that you found. Consciousless, pitiless, unnecessarily torturous. How about what if he'd have stopped killing after Jessica Gawi? Now, we don't have a picture of Jessica in the theater. They tried to save her. But this is her before the defendant. What if he'd have stopped killing here? Would anything that you have seen outweighed 11 dead? Consciousless and pitiless. He waits in the concession area near theater number nine. Think about the patience. Think about the cold-bloodedness. He is standing there surrounded by people that he knows he is going to try to murder very shortly as they sit in their seats around him. 
using this kind of a weapon, a shotgun, <coughs> unnecessarily torturous. He pins them in with tear gas to rob them of the ability to breathe, to flee. Extreme discomfort, and it puts them in fear of stuff other than being shot. He killed his victims in a crowded movie theater, trapped by design in the darkness. Some victims unable to flee, surrounded by screams and pain and anguish. And if you close your eyes, you can picture it all. And death. There's nothing they could do about it. And he saw to that. At the moments of their deaths, his victims would not only be in fear for their lives, but as we've, as we've seen from some of the others who tried to protect people on their way to death, They'd be scared for their friends' lives and their families' lives. And he knew it. And remember, as you go back and analyze his decisions, there's not a single throwaway decision he made. There's not one unexplained purchase, not one unexplained web search. Every decision he makes is purposeful and rational towards an outrageously evil goal. Grave risk of death, he used this weapon with those 700 rounds, brought enough ammo to kill everyone almost twice steel penetrator rounds in this hundred round magazine. Remember the scatter shot spree he takes on here? Doesn't care where it goes. And these are his victims. I can't linger on these for more than a second or less. There are so many. This is the grave risk of death he visited on them because these are the people he wanted dead. Thank you, ma'am. Some of these you'll remember. You remember Dion Rospero walking up here showing you how he patrolled the front and walked up to him and looked him in the face before he pulled the trigger. Grave risk of death. How many surfing movies, how many tears from family members and teachers can outweigh this? He didn't stop killing after 11, though. There was one more. It was our six-year-old. And you have the picture of her back there. And I told you I'd never make you look at it again. This is how he finished up. Four bullets into this one. Is what you've heard here over the last week, is the passion, the description of the mental illness, does that outweigh all that? Does that get him life? You hesitate on this in your weighing process, take a moment and go back and watch the crime scene video. Bring yourself back to the aftermath of the defendant's rational, deliberate decision making before you make that decision. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He weighed his options. He made his choices and his decisions. And now you must weigh and make yours. Beyond a reasonable doubt, mitigating factors that exist if you find they exist, don't outweigh the aggravating factors. Not for this phase. On July 20th, 2012, with a long-standing hatred of mankind in his heart, an obsession to kill, and the end of a romantic relationship, the first of its kind for him, the end of a career, the one he dreamt of since he was a kid, according to his mom, he made a decision to massacre, and he did. Twelve dead from the community. Can anything outweigh that? Thank you, Mr. Brockler. All right, members of the jury, uh, the next step uh, in the proceedings, as you know, is to deliberate. And of course, only 12 of you, the 12 deliberating jurors, can do that. So I'm going to send back the 12 deliberating jurors to the jury room. The rest of you who are alternate jurors, I will uh, send to a different room. 
Uh, you're not to talk to each other during this time. Um, my admonitions with respect to the um, jurors, uh, deliberating jurors' conduct are included in instruction number one. In terms of the alternates, uh, the same admonitions I have been giving you throughout the trial apply to you. Not the ones in the jury instructions, but the ones I have been giving you throughout the trial. All right? Does everybody understand that? All right, and you are all to, to disregard the outburst earlier here today. You should treat it as though it never happened. Does everybody understand that? All right, and everybody's saying yes and nodding their head yes. Okay, with that then, uh, I'm going to let you start deliberating. Uh, those of you who are deliberating jurors and the rest of you, I'll let you take a break in, uh, in the other separate room. Okay, thank you, folks. I'll send back the original instructions and verdict forms. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jurors have all exited the courtroom now. Uh, is there anything uh, that the people would like to discuss at this time, Mr. Orman? Your Honor, I, I, you mentioned the disruption, and I know I was reading the, the transcript uh, that uh, the court reporter put a brief mention in her that there was a disruption or something in the gallery. But I think we just need to make a record of what happened. And one thing I'm going to do, if it's okay with the court, is uh, I know there's a TV feed for the courtroom not showing the gallery. But you can hear what's going on in the courtroom pretty clearly. And it, she was screaming pretty loud. And uh, I imagine Mr. Brocker's microphone might have picked it up or some other microphone. So I'm going to see if I can actually get a record of that. And hopefully we can make that a court exhibit. And I'm going to try to do that if that's okay with the court. Uh, is that okay with the defense? Sure. Yeah, that's fine with me as well. Uh, you said transcript. I think you meant real time. The real-time transcript, that's correct. It's not a transcript. It's just real-time. There is no transcript. You're looking at the real-time on the screen on your computer. Uh, you have to be accurate on these things. So it's not a transcript. I, I know what you mean, but for the record, you're referring to the real-time on your computer, correct? I'm referring to the real-time that's on the, the small computer that is placed on our table that is provided by the courts. So okay, fine. great. Thank you. Sure. All right, and for the record, this was a woman who uh, has indicated to the sheriff's department that she is homeless. Uh, the sheriff has had some concerns about her, uh, but she promised to behave in the courtroom, and this is a public courtroom. She's been here for the last handful of days and has been uh, complying with all of my orders that relate to um, people's behavior in the courtroom and to the decorum that has to be observed in court. So we had no basis to exclude her from the courtroom. It's a public courtroom. and. Uh, um, but it's someone that we were aware of. I think the parties may have been aware of her as well. Uh, and uh, she's obviously not going to be allowed in the courtroom for any future proceedings in this case. Um, do the parties have any position uh, with respect to whether I um, conduct any other types of proceedings with respect to her? Well, Your Honor, it's, you're, you're the court. And um, that was certainly contemptuous. I don't believe I've ever actually, I've, I've been a lawyer since 1991, and I've appeared in courts all over this state and in, in Maryland as well, and I've seen lots of contemptuous behavior directed towards the court. I have never seen behavior that contemptuous uh, towards uh, the court, towards the dignity of the court, towards the sanctity of the proceedings. Uh, it is, as we say in the law, direct contempt, because Your Honor witnessed it. It happened in the courtroom. If there was ever a circumstance where someone deserved to be found in direct contempt of court, it was that person who created that disruption. Uh, I think, Your Honor, should bring her in here. I don't know where she is. I don't know what the sheriffs did with her. And have a hearing and find her in contempt of court and treat her accordingly. That's my position. All right. Uh, I know that she's currently being detained uh, until I decide what to do. So, Ms. Brady, anything from you? Your Honor, I think she's obviously mentally ill. I don't think holding her in contempt is going to help with that. And um, 
I mean, perhaps uh, see if the county attorney wants to check into maybe she needs some psychiatric help. We've all discussed how there's a statute where you can hospitalize someone you feel is mentally ill. Perhaps that would be the more humane approach to this. Well, I'm not going to assume that she's mentally ill. Uh, I, I don't know whether she is or she's not. I know that uh, the, the sheriff was concerned about her for different reasons, but I also know that uh, w the sheriff was very clear with her uh, about the rules when you're in the courtroom, and I know that she's been following those rules for the past five days, and she chose not to do so today. So that's, that's what I know. Uh, in terms of whether she's mentally ill or not, I'm not going to make any assumptions. Mr. Bruckler? Your Honor, I only ask you if the court would permit me to just supplement the record from my vantage point with the jury. Um, it, clearly the outburst d distracted the jurors and interrupted the uh, closing statement. And I appreciate the court giving me a little extra time. It, when I started back up, I could tell, even because of the um, noise coming in from the outside, there were still numerous jurors that were not tracking the closing. They were looking towards the door where this outrageous act had taken place. And I appreciate the court giving me time, but I do think the record should reflect it. For a couple minutes, at least in the middle there, uh, several of the jurors seemed uh, unfocused because of this incident. All right. Thank you. Is there anything else from anyone else at this time? I'm going to take that issue under advisement. I'm going to think about what to do. Um, but I felt it was important to tell the jurors to ignore that and to not let that affect their deliberations. And as soon as I started saying that, they all started, started nodding their head, their heads and acknowledging um, that they understood that and, and, and that wasn't going to affect them. And uh, I have no doubt that this will have uh, no interference whatsoever in terms of the decision that the juries or the decisions that the jury makes. So. All right, we'll take a break. If the attorneys would please uh, stay around in case there's a question or I need to talk to you, as soon as the jurors um, go home, we will let you know. My expectation is that they will go home at 4.30, but if that changes, I'll let you know, and if it doesn't, we'll let you know that as well. Okay, the court will be in recess. Thanks, everyone.